the whole intention of the policies that drive the market are to deliver the sustainability benefits that the regulators want to incentivize. So we as an industry need to be able to demonstrate the sustainability characteristics of the products we, the industry supplies into the market. And the traceability systems that we've developed over the last 10 years have been good enough to allow us to scale quickly. But in terms of securing the investment that we need and reassuring the customers of those sustainability benefits, we still need to do some work to, uh, to improve those traceability systems. The various regulators around the world that drive the, the market for us dictate the specific risks that they're concerned about and the sustainability attributes that they want to incentivize. And that makes its way into the verification systems that are deployed into the supply chain. So. Those regulations need to be applied by the world's biggest energy companies, but also the people on the street that collect food waste and use cooking oil from cafes and restaurants. And there are, there are millions of those people that work in cities every day who have to live with this regulatory requirement to report the sustainability characteristics. So we want those regulations to be satisfied, but we also want to implement them in a way that's conducive to increasing the scale of supply and making those people's lives easier. The ones who perform that job need to be supported rather than um, have a, a barrier imposed on them through, through bureaucratic traceability requirements. The scale of the supply chain shows that uh, the day-to-day -day operations are extremely diverse. We have feedstock being sourced from the streets of Chicago, the streets of London, but also from Shanghai and every other city in the world with a, with a big population or a, yeah, a highly dense population. Um, so the day-to-day -day operations are very diverse. The solutions, the, the solutions that are deployed in the market are also diverse. People use a range of paperwork or IT systems or mobile apps to record those collections. And um, yeah, the, the industry generally has to agree a consensus on the minimum amount of information required to demonstrate compliance uh, and the maximum amount of uh, confidence to enable the maximum amount of confidence that we can give to the regulators and the people who incentivize the market. Well, I'm here in Chicago to learn the exact requirements on what's required in the US. We've built uh, compliance regimes, at, at IT solutions that help demonstrate compliance into the European market that has very clearly defined requirements. I think the requirements in the US for UCO traceability are relatively set in stone in the, uh, in the RFS guidance, but they're implemented in very different ways across the supply chain. And I think the, the spectrum of how those traceability efforts are, uh, are deployed in the market shows that there are some, some supply chains that are more vulnerable to, to risk and mislabeling than others. And so we'd like, I'd, I'm here to learn to understand what does the supply chain feel is sufficient evidence to demonstrate UCO traceability? Are those companies willing to raise the bar to a level where they are happy to comply with, but also that they demand of their competitors? So can we raise the bar to create a fair market for everyone uh, without imposing too much bureaucracy on the supply chain to, to enable it to scale to the levels it wants to? Well, clearly every, every city that that has a lot of people creates yuko and creates food waste. So there's, there is a physical potential of supply. They, the, the companies in the market that are delivering that demand have said that there is no cap so far on how, how large that physical supply potential is. I think regulators and the industry and the people who assess risk in the supply chain need to decide, is that scale delivered by credible physical volumes or is it somehow finding gaps in the compliance system to inflate those volumes with other products that people don't necessarily want to incentivize? Are there other streams of fats and oils that are being uh, blended into the UCO supply chain and sold as UCO? That, that has happened in Europe and there are fears that it might happen again uh, in the US and in Europe. So uh, I think we have a, a bit of soul searching to do to understand the, the total physical potential. Uh, and how we get confident on that number.